This podcast is a collaboration between Costard and Touchstone Productions and the Dads from the Crypt podcast. They all want to kill me. They want me to die. Mona, let's get out of here. Let's just pack up our stuff and leave before it's too late. I wish I could. It was already too late. I wish I could. From all over the building, I could hear them. I'm gonna get you, Mona, if it's the last thing I do! Hello, and welcome to another episode of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast. I'm Alan Katz. Gil will join me shortly for the interview. But first, if you're catching this on our YouTube channel, please hit the like button if you like our content. And even better, please subscribe. I've got a confession. I have never in my entire life ever scored anything musical because I have no musical talent, as in zero. I'm relatively good at listening to music, but playing it or making it, uh uh-uh. I can't score. Gil... On the other hand, he he was scoring back when he was in high school because Gil has always had musical talent. As he has said himself here, when he directs, he approaches every scene musically first. Even if we're going to play the scene dry at the end without any music, Gil still goes at every scene itself by setting it to music inside his head first. You can't blame him. Image plus sound, especially if it's music, that's maybe the most powerful thing humans have ever created. Music, or no music by choice, is as essential to audiovisual storytelling as lighting, acting, and dialogue. It's possible to save both crap acting and bullshit writing with a good piece of musical score. I've seen it happen. Yeah, scoring is definitely a superpower. I don't have it, but our friend Nick Pike sure does. By the score. Gil and I have been working with Nick since Freddie's Nightmare. In fact, Nick got to tell some of the Crypt even before Gil and I did. Nick scored one of Crypt's first three episodes, the classics that started the series going. Dig that cat, he's real gone. Houdini himself couldn't have gotten out of him. I give to you, Ulrich, the undying! But I'm getting ahead of myself. And yes, that is Michael Jackson standing with Nick. They work together. I'm not kidding. Nick's story is amazing. We'll talk about where Nick came from, England, then South Africa, his musical education, how South African playwright Athel Fugard kept Nick in the music game, which resulted in Nick conducting the London Symphony Orchestra at Abbey Road Studios. Our subscribers will get to hear all those amazing stories. Another really good reason to subscribe, but to kick us off, We'll pick up Nick's story with his first attempt to break into Hollywood. A flute student had connected Nick to a movie producer who needed a composer. So Nick made his pitch. I'd like to come out to, to Hollywood and, you know, could, could, could we meet up? And he says, oh, sure, kid. You know, just, you know send me your piece. And, uh, you know, and uh, when you come out, call me up. We'll have lunch. And I was like, yes, there's, there's something's going to happen here, you know. <laughs> so months later. I'm finally coming out to to LA, you know, and my then girlfriend, now wife, Elizabeth, uh, her father was big TV director. Uh, E.W. Swackhammer was his name. Mm. And um, so, uh, so, so, so I'm all prepped. I'm, you know, I'm coming out to meet this guy and, uh, you know, we're, we're at some little barbecue. Uh, oh no, that was a different, different thing. I'll tell you about that one later. But, but so, 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 so I call up his office, and his secretary says, "Oh, I'm sorry, you know he's shooting downtown this week, and uh, you know he's very, very busy." I'm like, oh, "Shit, you know I've come all the way out from New York, you know, you know, on money that I don't have." Uh, but I was staying at Elizabeth's house, right, and and her father's house, and so, so I guess I was looking a little long in the long in that face, you know, and so the swag says to me, "What's the matter, kid?" So I tell him the whole story. You know, it's a guy, and you know, he's shooting downtown. He's, Give me the phone number. <laughs> he calls up. Oh, Where's he shooting? 
uh, Mr. Swank, he's down at the corner of blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Oh, thanks. Boom. He says, all right, kid, take my car. He had this like 1965 Cougar convertible. It was like beautiful. Uh, he said, take my car, you know, go get him. I was like, shit, okay. So, <laughs> so I get in this car. And I, I remember distinctly driving on the 101 past the Capitol building through Hollywood. And it's like 80 degrees, a beautiful day. And yeah. thinking, this, this, this is the place to be. This, this is it. You know, I got to make somehow this has to work. So, so I get down there and they're all having lunch at, on the set. Right. So uh, I see him. He sees me. He says, hey, come on over. He says, uh, you know, what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, I'm in town this week and I thought, I'd, you know, see if, see if we can catch up and, you know, blah, blah, blah. See if you can give me a job. If that translates to. Uh, <laughs> so he says, uh, you didn't bring that the, the cassette with the, your, your piece on it, did you? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. He says, give me the tape. He disappears into his tra trailer and I'm sitting there. Everybody goes back to work. You know, I'm the only person sitting in this lunch area and I'm thinking, oh, man, now what, you know? So I, I just I feel like a complete fifth wheel. So so I thought, well, let me just walk around, see if I can see him. And uh, you know, maybe he listened to the piece and didn't like it and you know didn't want to talk anymore. I don't know why. So so I'm looking around. I look you were this, you were filling the silence with dread. Yes, hundred percent, you know. Uh, all like I like a do, Swedish, like a Swedish movie from the fifties. Exactly. All I wanted to do was get away from there, you know. Uh, um but I look inside this one doorway and I see him and he sees me. He says, hey, hey, fantastic, fantastic piece. Call this guy, Alan Barnett, and tell him, we, tell him we're going to do an episode. I was like, wow, yes, thanks. You know, so like the drive back was heaven, you know. Um, and, you know, I mean, it still took a long time, you know, but but eventually, you know, I came out and did my first, uh, you know, first session. It was uh, like a 35 piece orchestra for this Hitchcock Presents series um at at universal um but before i left you, you know and, and uh well actually was that i'm trying to remember you, what you, you didn't have a 45 piece orchestra when you when you were doing freddie's nightmares did you no no i mean this this was the this was the day when i guess just making sure because <laughs> i didn't get paid but the, the little bit of writing i did like, like there was a 45 piece orchestra backing anybody up yeah no no i, I don't know where all the money went but it didn't go <laughs> into the top pockets money uh, anyway <laughs> carry you, on i i apologize do you know how much money we had for per episode of freddy's nightmares for an hour no four hundred and thirty five thousand dollars an episode wow <laughs> That's hilarious. That's we were hilarious shooting number. just ju just so you get the perspective we were shooting 10 pages a day every day Jeez. That's a far cry from the twenty million an episode for fifteen million an episode for you know Game of Thrones. Right? Boy, yeah. Oh man, two two opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you get the Alfred Hitchcock presents that that. Uh, well, you know, in its own way, the game came to you. you know, and. I guess uh, yeah, I guess at the end of the day, it sort of did, you know. And and hey, but you were there when the game came, and and you 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 delivered. You wrote a, a terrific episode, a, a great score for that episode. I, it, I I I I'm assuming is I've never heard it, but I'm assuming it is because you got hired off of it. So it's certainly as a calling card. It seemed to do what you want a calling card to do. Definitely open some doors for sure. Yeah. Bob Shea wanted me to do the score because I had done a movie for them called Critters 2, which he was really he loved the score from that. You know, I had done all this stuff like bowed symbols and it came out with all these like really Yeah, you, you, you like using unusual sounds and interesting instrumentation. Yes, yeah, for sure. That's what you're, you're known for. Especially the horror stuff, because that, that really lends itself to it. get that stringent metallic sound yeah yep yeah, exactly uh, which you know i was thinking what well, he's got this hand he's got blades coming out of his fingers you know that's it's metal it's sure. you know, it's that kind of thing so <laughs> but you know as so often happens you you kind of go out on a limb creatively and then when you when when reality sets in you think 
have I have I kind of gone completely bonkers? And you know, they're going to think, what the fuck have we done? You know, that that's the moment where you're like, you know, and that was the moment once I put the cassette in and started playing it, and you know, it was only like twenty or thirty seconds long, this thing. And but that's what it was going through my mind's, you know, when it was but playing. But Toby Hooper and Bob Shea. And as soon as it ended, Bob's like, "That's fantastic! That's fucking fantastic!" And 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 uh, Toby's like, "Well, yeah, man, yeah, that's that's really the shit, man." <laughs> it's a very good Toby. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and so, uh, so that was that was a great moment, you know. So, um, so yeah, so I, you know, and and I think after that, this this guy Junior, who was the guy who who basically gave me my first Hollywood job that I orchestrated for, uh, he and another guy did a lot of episodes. I think I got him him on, um, and uh, and there was a third person who came on, I think maybe for the second season, I can't remember exactly. Mm-hmm. But but you established the, uh, you stuck yeah. the bar where it needed to be and created the, the signature sound, the, you know, the uh, the franchise sound. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. You know, yeah. that's, that's uh, as, as Gil and I have created franchise characters, you know, we, we Creating the franchise is really, really important, and uh, and, and it sucks that, that that you don't end up owning it. It does. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. So your work on on Freddy suddenly you're you're getting you're getting hired, and and uh, well, but let me let me just back up a second. Before I left New York, I got a film uh, called Graveyard Shift. Stephen King invites you to venture deep inside the caverns below the old Bachman Mill. You're not thinking about going down in there. It We're was a my secret. first film, and uh, you know, through from. the same Brazilian guy. Oh, you got to be my friend, man. He's an Italian guy. He's, he's great. He's a producer. I'm thinking, okay. So I meet the guy, and he says, uh, you know, can you come tonight? We're having a screening of the film. You know, just, you see, if, see if you like it, see if you want to work on it. And I said, okay. So I go to the screening and there's, you know, 40 or 50 people in some little dingy theater in New York. And, you know, you, you know how you hand out the, the pieces of paper and the pencils to make to, to, you know, give, give any notes that you want to give. After I watched this film, I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is like the worst piece of shit I have ever seen. <laughs> and I couldn't think of one thing to say. And so I just kind of sculpted out of there. You know, he was busy talking to the people and blah, blah, blah. I just kind of sculpted out of there. You know, I, I can't do that. So a couple of days go past and he calls me up and he says, so uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to you at the screening because I'd walked. <laughs> so he, he said, so, so what do you think of the film? And I'd had a couple of days to like calm down and think big picture. And I said, well, you know, I, I, you know, I think it's pretty cool. I think I could do something, you know, I could do some interesting stuff for it, you know. And he's like, oh, great, great. Well, you know, I've got twenty thousand uh, dollars. You know, come and meet me, and, I, and I'll give you some money. I was like, okay. So we, we meet <laughs> we in some coffee shop, and I don't know where this guy got money from. I, you know, uh, I just, I'll just say that he's Italian. Um, and he he uh, so we we're at this coffee place and he says uh, so yeah I'm glad glad to have you on board you know Felipe says beautiful things about you and, you know blah 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 and uh, and and here's the money and he pulls out an envelope I mean a thick envelope with ten thousand dollars in it he says here this this should get you started you know I was like that would get me started all right yeah so. Uh, that was, you know, even though the experience... The Don't experience, hide it all in one place. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically what it allowed me to do is buy all this equipment that I was going to need to generate the score, you know, and, and and hire a little studio and an engineer and blah, 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 wow. uh, and, and get it to get it all done, you know. And and, uh, and that left me with 10 grand, which is what I came out to L.A. with, you know, I, with 10 grand. I had a suitcase with some clothes in it. I had a box with some equipment in it. And I had my windsurfer. Those Damn, were- that never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are my priorities right there, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I so I had the 10 grand, which, you know, I figured, well, you know, this will hopefully keep me going for maybe a year. 
you know, if Ooh. I'm careful, uh, and and by then, you know, what what year was that? That was 1986. Yeah, I was here in 1985. I, I don't know if 10 grand would, would have kept you going for a year even back then, but okay. That was tight. Uh, for sure, it was tight, you know, but but I got some jobs. See, that's uh, yeah. so. Do, do you remember the name of the coffee shop? <laughs> New York? I don't remember. It was something on Madison <laughs> Avenue. It was like some, you know, like a part of town that I never went to because I couldn't afford to right. do anything, right. you know, nothing. <laughs> it was somewhere up on the Upper East Side, Madison Avenue, you know. Yeah. All right, so you get here, and the gigs start to come, and hey, people are starting to discover you. You're you're becoming a regular in, in certain people's uh, Rolodex. Mm -hmm. It's you know yours is getting a lot of finger marks all over it. Uh, I know that uh, when when Gil was doing the pilot for CBS Haunted Lives True Ghost Stories. Yep. Lives called you yeah and uh you did that for us and then uh we started to get involved a little bit after that on a thing called tales from the crypt now when gill and i joined tales from the crypt on season three you'd already been there <clears throat> you were there in fact you did the uh the score for one of the first three episodes you you did the score for dig that dig uh, dig that cat he's real gone right dick donna Yep. Yeah, and which that, is yeah, great. That, that, that was my fucking my, episode. Yeah. Oh man, and and can I tell you? I, I don't know how I don't know how I got that gig, but I think Joel Silver had somebody else that he wanted to do the music, hmm. but Dick, for some reason, wanted me to do it, and Dick, of course, said, you know, got 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 what Dick oh, wanted. Well, yeah, it, it, where where Joel is concerned, Dick was going to have his way. Fuck no. you, Joel. <laughs> Truly, as one of the few people who could really tell Joel to go fuck himself right. and, and really get away with it. But yeah, although, so although I saw a lot, many, I saw I was there for many occasions when him telling him to go fuck himself didn't exactly work out that way. Is that right? not, not at the moment. And, but and I got I, I was in the middle. <laughs> well, that's not a good place to be. No, no, no. <laughs> well, so so Dick, he says, uh, he calls, calls me up and says, Kid, come on in. Let's talk. So I was like, okay, okay, Mr. Donna. And he says, uh, <laughs> you know where I am? Yeah, Warner Brothers, yeah. And so so I go over there, and I go over to the office, and I go into his his office, which is, like, amazing. It's huge. Right. All this mm. memorabilia. And the, yeah. It's just, it's just, dogs and dogs. Yeah, it's it's my it was mind-blowing, you know? Uh, he's like, ah, come on in, kid. Have a seat. He says, so... Uh, I got to tell you, talking to a composer is the hardest thing in the world for me. So all I can suggest is you smoke some shit and see what you can come up with. <laughs> I'll dig, I'll dig Donner. <laughs> that's so oh, funny. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> he was wonderful. Oh, God, he was but, wonderful. Yeah, but my man, what a what a guy, what a special special guy, man. Uh, that guy, you know. And so, so like a couple of weeks later, you know, I call him. I've said, Dick, I got some stuff to show you. You know, would you be able to come come over to my little studio and you know I could play it for you? He says, Yeah, sure, kid. Tell me when you want me there. So, I, so we, you know, we, we agreed on a time. And right about then, I'd bought like you know, this is like, you know, when synthesizers and samplers were like there was all this stuff coming out and it was you know, it was a pretty exciting time. And and so there was something called an emulator, which was Kind of like basically the top top of the the pile in terms of you know that that type of thing, and uh, you know I had just enough money to buy two of these things because they were ten thousand dollars each, thousand dollars each, and that basically cleaned me out. So I bought two of these things, and uh, yeah, they were amazing, but they were they were also like you know a little bit finicky, you know, like <laughs> so. So the day that he was coming over, oh no, yeah, uh, you know, I'm again, I'm looking, I'm looking at everything and just playing everything, checking, checking it over before he comes over, you know, um, and then uh, I went to do something. I came back, and all of a sudden, there's no sound. These things, there's nothing coming out of these boxes. I'm like, oh my fucking god, you know, Dick's gonna be here in five minutes, and 
So I'm like, so I like get the screwdriver, I take the top of this thing. I'm like, you know, jiggling cables and, and, and like, you know, and 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 I hear I hear the gate because I was on this <laughs> oh, the gate opening. I'm like, oh, it's like a horror movie. It was a horror movie. And and so and and finally I jiggle this one cable and it comes to life. And I'm like, thank God, fuck. You know, Dick walks in, hey kid, all right, let's see what you got. You know? And and everything worked. I played it for him. He loved it. And uh yeah. And then, that so was then, dig dig that cat, he's a real gun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so so just to cap that off, you know, because Joel did I wasn't Joel's choice, you know, he wasn't gonna like anything I did. So we're on the dubbing stage actually. And you know, one of the cue, one of the major cues is playing, and he come he walks in and he's like every every bone in his body wants to say, What the fuck is this? you know. But eventually it ends, he had to say, you know, it doesn't sound half bad. <laughs> That's the best you're gonna get, by the way, from him. Oh boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh but yeah, that was the beginning of Tales from the Crypt. And you ended up doing nine more at the end of at, at by the end of it, right through uh really right to to, to the last season. Uh yeah. Uh yeah. I even did one for this uh for this guy Gil, Gil Adler. He directed Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh <laughs> you yeah. did uh what's cooking? Uh you did th that Gil directed. You, you did a couple that, that we wrote. Uh yeah. but what's cooking was a special was special because because Gil directed it and, and uh, you know, Gil, you've said before that you always approach directing from a musical perspective. Yeah, I used to always think about, OK, what's the music that I hear in my head? What style, what composition, what instrumentation, which would help me direct and give me a sense of rhythm as to how I wanted to make my shots and, and cut it so that it had that rhythm. And so I would always go to music first. And, and maybe it's maybe that's a throwback to when I was in college and was studying music. But it just felt to me that that was a, a solid place for me to start. Mm -hmm. And I've always done that. Well, you I, I remember you were very specific about you. You wanted like a kind of a jazz thing with like trumpet and, and stuff like that. none of this smoke some shit and see what you can come up with you know you knew exactly what well, i remember i i was i i loved louis armstrong i mean to this day he could do no wrong and i remember i loved louis armstrong in the early days like in the 20s and the 30s and i had those cassettes and i had those albums that Potato i would play all head the time blues that kind of stuff and i just would love that early louis armstrong stuff and i think i think we started with that yeah yeah yeah, as we were as we were writing it, we that's we, we kind of put that on a little bit. We we had some yeah. a bunch of uh, yeah, like with, with Potato Head Blues. We yeah, that was right. one track that we listened to, and and that kind of motivated the the you know, the the back and forth of of the dialogue. Really, we we were trying to find kind of a jazzy. And that was the reference for me. That was sort of like the reference, and and we would build from that. We would build out from that. We would go away from it, but usually would eventually sort of round roundabout come back. Um, but that was always it. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, a, a, cool it's a great score. Yeah, it was musically. It was really fun, and it really, I think, you know, it was something very different to. Uh, to you it was, know, it was a great score. I love that score. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You know, it's. Scoring comedy is 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 tricky, of course, because you don't want to you want to set the joke up, you don't want to kill the joke, mm -hmm. and, and you don't want to you know after the joke is almost the most important part because you don't want to you know screw up what what was right. so finely yeah crafted yeah. <laughs> yeah and because it's dark comedy you have to catch you know the the edge to it but you also want to really underscore the fact that this is absurd yeah yeah there's got to be some winking going on as well as the the dark you know you know the dark the dread and whatever else is going sure on. yeah 
you also scored an episode that Bill Malone directed, Only Skin Deep. which uh, one of my favorite episodes of good. them all. Yeah. And that's got a great, uh, a haunting score. I mean, it's, it's all noise. It's, it's, it's like yeah. a, like a, like an industrial steampunk score. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, Bill, <laughs> he's a dark, dark man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Inside that lovely exterior, man. And, and he, you know, <laughs> his, <laughs> You know, so I've done a couple of films with him subsequent to all that and other yeah. stuff. And uh, <clears throat> and his his uh, his um, you know his direction is always you know it can't be too dark for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, oh, that's that, that wow that that really opens the floodgates because in horror you know musically man it's it's just such an open open uh, you know palette of everything you know mm, mm -hmm, where you can mm -hmm. go um and uh, bill yeah bill just you know so so that 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 was a really some really strange stuff going on in that in that score yeah, yeah. oh and it's it's haunting it it makes it was it's a great episode because everything comes together i mean sherry rose is fantastic in it bill's direction is it's just yeah. every moment is 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 a lovely bill it's very disturbing. Yeah. It's very, very disturbing. It's in the best possible way. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> you, was that the first time that you worked with Bill? I think that was the first time I worked with Bill. Yeah. Because I, I knew him a little bit through Mick Garris, who had introduced mm -hmm. me, I think, to him. Right. Um, and um, you also worked with Mick on, on Tales. You did uh, his episode, uh, Whirlpool. Right. Right. Which we also wrote. Yeah. Uh, was that the first time you worked with with Mick? No, no. I worked with Mick uh, on my first film out here, which was Critters Two, the, the right. new that's line that's thing right. with that's Bob right. Shay. Um, and that's right. and I guess you know, um, I think I think Mick had wanted um, Peter Bernstein to do the score because Peter had done uh, something of his in the past, uh, and but but I, I guess it didn't work out. For some reason, uh, I don't know if Peter was busy or whatever. So I was sort of next in line, and uh, and uh, you know that was uh, yeah, that was that was a great opportunity, a really fun film, and uh, you know that that did a lot as well. You know, and, and of course Mick, you know, I probably worked on more stuff with Mick than anybody else. So you're you're like his John Williams. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and he, yeah. he and he's your Spielberg. Yeah. 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 I mean, but we, but then again, Mick is a, a a Spielberg of horror, so so there's that. So yeah, yeah I, that makes you the John Williams of horror. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, I'll I'll take it. <laughs> the experience on Critters Two was was a little odd, in that we had to do it with a non-union orchestra at this studio out in Alhambra. I mean, it was all very funky, but you know, it it came off. You know, and uh, we, we we had the you know. And we we didn't have much time. Eighteen days I had to write this score, uh, hmm. five minutes of music, um, and uh, so yeah, it was crazy, you know, just crazy. But but we got it done and uh, it came off really well. And and the next thing um, we did, I I can't, I don't know if we when was the year of uh, was it Whirlpool? Did you say? I I think it was yeah, it must be before Whirlpool. We did a film called Sleepwalkers, Stephen King's Sleepwalkers. Right, right, right. Which was a you know pretty big budget uh, you know Columbia Picture thing, uh, and so we recorded. We had big orchestra, of seventy pieces at um, at MGM, which you know I mean that room, the MGM scoring stage is probably the best sounding room in the world. That and Abbey Road uh, 
a, mm -hmm. a studio at Abbey Road. Those two rooms were like spectacular. And uh, so that one was, you know, that was sort of the creme de luxe in all areas, you know, top engineer, top everything, top top orchestra, top players. And it was amazing. It was fantastic. That must be just to, to know that you are, that you have gotten to a place where these people are more than happy to work with you. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? You, 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 and you all fit together and you know it, you've, hey man, how, you've arrived when really your your peers, yeah, really, yeah, no. really, they're they're just happy to work with you. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's it's like an incredible experience to be, you know, with these seventy, the top seventy players in in, in probably in the world in terms of mm. what they do, and and the, the top engineer in the in the best studio. I mean, it's it's Nirvana, you know, and Indeed. and they're recording your music, you know, it's like amazing. I, uh, you know, we we understand this feeling, Gil and I. When when I look at, at the actors we got to work with on Tales yeah. from the Crypt, and you know, when when you see certain, when you have Kirk Kirk Douglas talking words that you typed, right? Yeah, and, uh, it's just yeah. like that is a beautiful thing. Described a moment. One of the episodes we did was that, that Bob directed. Uh, it was called "You Murderer," and. Uh, he, he it also featured Humphrey Bogart, but also Isabella Rossellini. Mm -hmm. And when Isabella came into it, the whole thing was played as kind of a, a, a 1930s noir. And Isabella wanted to do her character as as her mom is uh, uh, Ingrid Bergman in Casablanca. Yep. Wow. Well, fucking pinch me. You know, I, when we when we did the her wardrobe fitting. Yeah. And she's a lovely, wonderful, exquisitely salt of the earth kind of person. So much fun just to hang with, yeah. and just watching her come out with with you know the the ward the looks that that Randall Throp had created for her, uh, where you know she's trying to look like her mom in Casablanca, and she's this is that's a sublime moment as a film person. You're watch, I'm watching Isabella Rossellini trying to imitate Ingrid Ber Bergman as uh, Elsa in Casablanca. And I'm standing here and this, she's doing this because to be in my little dumb little TV show. Yeah. No, that's uh, amazing. How the fuck does this happen? Yeah. 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 So yeah, no, no. These are, these are the moments we should never take them for granted ever, 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 ever. Sure. They're just cherished, cherished moments. Even Stephen King loved you doing you scoring his his stuff. He said of your score for The Shining uh, that Nick Pike's music is some of the best. It adds to the spooky ambiance of the Overlook Hotel as it comes slithering out of your stereo speakers. At least, don't say you weren't warned. <laughs> I know, man. That's a that's a great endorsement. Isn't it? That was that was a really really beautiful thing that he wrote there. It was uh, you know, it was really nice. Yeah, great. Uh, sure. Yeah. As we as we continue through your uh, your catalog, <laughs> uh, things that that are connected to us at least, because uh, the rest of screw that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we also sucked you into Weird World. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Married with Children's Ed O'Neill brings together the greatest minds on Earth. The government has promised to leave us alone. To find the secrets of the future. Two days from now, I'm going to be murdered. But sometimes, knowing too much... I found a way to reverse the aging process. ...can kill you. You'll never get away with this. I already have. Welcome to a world unlike anything you've ever seen. Weird world. <laughs> Oh, you say that now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the last thing I'm gonna say about Weird World. Oh my god. But yeah, but you 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 were, you know, the music was just the music. You you got it at the end of all the 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 crazy, stupid bullshit that that we had set uh, how we'd set ourselves up for failure by writing a script without ever contemplating a budget. Oh, oh, is that what happened? I, I had no it idea. was sci-fi. We we you know, we we got this great, hey, we're gonna do a TV movie for Fox, a backdoor pilot, you you know, sci-fi. Yeah. And uh I don't. I, I, I never knew what the budget was when when we started writing the script. I, I didn't know that there even was a budget. It was a pick a number, and right. so we just wrote the script, and we never budgeted. It and we were coming back from England, I think, and uh, I, I think that's what it was. Anyway, we we were uh, we finally had it budgeted. F. A. Miller finally budgeted the script and said, you know, um, 
we budgeted the script at like 3.5 and, and we have 1.9 and we have 1.8 million for, for it. So um, you, we had to figure this out, guys. At the end of the day, you know, we we scrunched the 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 schedule down to nothing, and and Bill directed, yeah. and his the clever innovation was we'll do the whole thing using a steady cam. So his one to ask was just you got to give me a steady cam operated, you know, through through the whole shoot. Right. Okay, and that was kind of how we did the page count that we did to do it in in a a really truncated number of days. Mm -hmm. Wow. So then we hand you, so we handed you, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, Less than ideal, shall we say. <laughs> you know, I've never even watched it. I I, I couldn't, did you score it? I, I wouldn't even know. I've never watched it. I just, <laughs> a, a, after we handed it in, I was done with that fucking thing. Oh man, I can imagine. It sounds like a nightmare for you guys. I Musically, I enjoyed it because I, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I, I used to, I remember using a guitar player, a, a guy I'd known a long time at Berkeley, and he became one of the top session guys out in LA, Michael Thompson, to do this certain type of playing that I knew he could do, which is sort of like this whistle tone kind of thing. Yeah. Huh. It was so eerie and cool, and it was it worked, I think, beautifully in the film. You know? Oh, fuck me. Now I'm going to have to go watch it just to witness your score. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> Damn well, you can you. just listen to the score and close your eyes. Well, yeah, that, that's a thought. Well, um, but but let, let me. I just want to, you know, what you were talking about is yeah. the, 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 you know, the three point five million, and you only had only had one point eight. I did something at, at Disney. Uh, uh, was a, a sh an animated short called The Prince and the Pauper, with Mickey, Goofy, and Donald, and it opened for the Rescuers Down Under. And uh, you know, when I got the job, they said, "Well, we got twenty five thousand dollars for the score," which you know. Uh, it's basically one one session with maybe maybe fifty players, maybe you know. So so not a lot of money. Um, and uh, so as we're getting into the process, you know, uh, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg says, uh, "Yeah, I want to all. I want a music meeting." So we have this music meeting, and he says, "I, I want to hear these these big these three big cues next week before we go any further." And we're like, uh, okay. There was the twenty-five grand gone. Boom, one session. And uh, <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, there was all the money in the world to, to do this score, right? So, so it's like you just you don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. if you, people tell you beforehand, this is what we've got, but then uh, when actually no, we've got a lot more. But you know, we're just gonna, you know, we're just gonna say we've got this much for the moment <laughs> until yeah. we need to. Money is a very strange thing, and certainly, you know, production money is a strange thing. I mean, Gil, you know, you know, you produced movies when you were doing all Warner Brothers tent poles, right? I mean, what was the what was the biggest biggest budget that that you you dealt with when you were doing the Warner Brothers movies? Uh, well, Superman was pretty well up there; it was over two hundred million, huh. and Constantine was uh, ninety seven million. Uh, but even as you go to into battle with okay, let's say two hundred million, you're making Superman. It, it, it never feels like you you have a, a ton of money in the bank. You're, you're no, still because you've up, got up you've got a ton it. of visual effect shots. You've yeah. got a, you've got Every, a big orchestra. You've got a spent. big score. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, so it, yeah, it never feels like a lot of money, even when it's a lot of money, does it? No, no, and there's always there's always an opportunity. I'll call it opportunity to mm -hmm. truncate and. Mm -hmm make it more streamlined and use less visual effect shots instead of the 25, you only have 18 or, you know, using music cues and repeating them from what you've already recorded. Or, I mean, there are always ways of figuring out how to bring things smaller. Mm. You know, um, that's kind of what my career was like in terms of Warner Brothers, because when they first approached me about Constantine, for example, they had a budget of 109 million hmm. and lorenzo brought me in uh de bonaventura and he said i'm not going to spend more than 97 million and he said so can you do that and i said I, I don't know you're talking to the wrong guy why don't we bring in the director there's no director yet oh well we should get a director <laughs> so then we spent a few weeks working on that and then we brought in francis lawrence 
And Francis and I got together and talked through the whole movie and page by page. And and Lorenzo said, well, it's 109. I got to bring it down to 97. And I said, well, you should bring the two of us in and into, into your office and ask us both. Don't ask just me because I'm reacting to what he sees. Mm -hmm. So we did that and, and we had answers for pretty much everything. And then we did a budget. And I, I think the first pass, we went from 109 million to like a 90, 98 or 99. And I thought we had done a great job in two weeks. And we gave it in and Lorenzo called me at home, so pissed off and yelling and screaming at me going, I told you not a penny more than 97. Why the fuck would you give me a budget of 99? And I said, because that's where we are at the moment. And we didn't take any surgical tools to the script. If you want to go lower than that, I've got to surgically do something to the script. And the answer was, I don't give a shit what you do. The number is 97. So we spent another two weeks and we cut out $2 million and, and made the movie. And they, they greenlit the, the picture at 97, not a penny more. We made the movie for 96 and did a cut, showed it to the studio. Lorenzo called me in and he said, uh, what do you think of the movie? And I said, well, look, you know, it works. It's clear. I personally miss this one visual effect sequence that we had in the kitchen. You don't need it. I know it will work without it. I personally miss it because I think it added a, a lot of fun to it. And, you know, it took him two weeks and basically called me and he said, "Where, where's the new stuff? And I said, you never greenlit it. You never said, OK, I'm wait I'm still waiting for you to say OK. And so we, we made it for we added back that scene. We added the million dollars and we made the movie for 97. But that's a whole work in progress of working back and forth with the creative team, especially the director. To make sure when I say, well, you've got 25 visual effect shots here. How would you feel if we only had 18? And I'm thinking these are the ones we take out. So the sequence still works, but it's going to be truncated. What, what are you thinking? How do you feel? And if that if there's an agreement there, then we can move forward. If there's no agreement there, then we've got to keep working and figure it out in other areas. I don't think a lot of people do that. I don't think a lot of people do that anymore if they did it then. And I think that's really a lot of the problem. From the music standpoint, we're always coming in basically at the end. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's 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 always up in the air whether there's going to be scraps or whether, you know, yeah. the budget has been stuck to and the music the music stays the same or, or yeah. whether, oh, no, you know, you're going to have to. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to fudge this one together, you know. It's good yeah. <clears throat> Um, but we, you know, we just um, wanted you to know how 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 you got there. Well, I, yeah, I mean it's it's such a process, isn't it? The whole oh my god, it it really is. It's that anything gets done and it doesn't look look like total crap is is yeah. is, a, is miraculous. It is. Well, a lot of times, you know, people take from other areas and figuring yeah. they'll figure it out later, right? And since music is at the end of the process, they take out from the music. Yeah, 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 I was always very nervous about doing that, and I would always protect the music, because again, from my perspective, I, I'm hearing the show and thinking about the show from a music point of view in my heart, in my head, and right. so I wanted to make sure we protected that. But I could see where a lot of people would say, "Oh, you know, that's something we can work out six months from now. We don't have to worry about that now." And if they really like it, they'll give us more money. Right, right. But the, the, and a lot of times that doesn't work. They won't give you more money. Yeah. So I was very protective with, with, with the stuff we were doing to make sure that the quality of the music was affordable. Well, you're one of the rare few, Gil. Well, because it meant so much to me, you know, personally, it just meant a lot to me. Well, I mean, all you have to do or all somebody has to do is watch a film or a TV series without any music. And you're like, oh, my yeah, yes. Right. Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you don't understand what what what. But not just scoring, but but good scoring. The it 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 adds a layer of nuance. You know, it can often bring the emotion to the script that the writer didn't. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more than nuance. You know, it's a lot more than nuance. It's really about that emotion. Yeah, and the emotional integrity of the whole piece. Yeah, really can be depicted in the music. And if you listen to the music, if you do just the opposite, 
don't listen to the to the movie without the music, but just listen to the music without the movie. Mm. You know, no dialogue. Just play the score as you play the movie. Mm-hmm. You'll learn a lot about the score. You'll learn a lot about the movie, the movie and you'll yeah. learn a lot about the characters. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the things that's happened in scoring in the last 10, 15 years is that, you know, um, for whatever reason, and I've got a few reasons, but uh, for whatever reason, you know, scores have gotten away from, from thematic development, you know. And to me, thematic development is everything in a film. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of you know the the emotional arc, in terms of tying scenes together, in terms of developing characters, you know all of those things, you know, uh, are so so important. And and so much scoring these days is just kind of wallpaper. That's yeah, you know, and uh, I, it's um, it's really unfortunate. I think, and I think part of the problem is a lot of directors don't want music on their film that takes away from the film. But what they're not realizing is that the music is actually bringing so much to it. Uh, so I don't know if it's like an ego thing or, or whatever it is, but it's it's something that's, uh, I think, a little unfortunate at the moment. Yeah, I think it's very unfortunate. I mean, I've been lucky that most of the directors I've worked with understand and appreciate the value of the music. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's a case where a lot of young directors, are, instead of scoring, they want uh, they want to pay music licenses and and really, in essence, in their heads, they're cutting to to music that they know. You know, I I think it's more in the TV world than the film world. You know, just because the the film world is such a funny place right now, it's either you know two hundred million dollar mm-hmm. budgets or you know half a million dollar budgets. Um, and certainly a couple of the young directors I work with uh, are super into music and 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 that kind of scoring where there's there's some thematic stuff going on and some development and and all that kind of thing because they can they, they they see what it's doing for their film you know mm. um, but I think in the TV world it's it's you know there's so much content being made and there, there's, there's so much you know so many series so many this and that and there's no time to you know beyond establishing and not even establishing a main title idea sound you know because often there is no main title or there's a little 10 second thing or yeah 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 yeah. don't forget a lot of times and especially in the last say five or ten years you know these the financiers have put more money into casting and the way they do that is they take it away from production and from post. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these directors are going, oh, God, I got this actor or this actress. That's great for the movie. Oh, we're paying her what? But then they're told, oh, instead of your 30-day shoot, you have 25 days or 22 days Mm -hmm. because that money is going to the actor. Well, that also happens to the score. And that also happens to the the mix at the end. Instead of having a a three-week mix, you have a 10-day mix. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that's happened... I've seen it happen along the way with some of the financiers. Mm. You know, the, from my point of view, the the other element to this whole picture, which is not good, uh, is, um, and you know, you'll hear composers, if you ever listen to a composer talking, <laughs> whoever's listening to this, um, the, the temp score world, the temp score business, where you know during the course of production, editors love to, especially a lot of them, <clears throat> love to cut to music, have music yeah. in the music you can get to, um, yeah, in yeah. order to sell, you know, yeah. the, the director or the producer. Yeah. Um, so, so the temp, the temp music becomes very important to this whatever piece of film or TV it is. And and so it's very hard to pry people off that temp music. And what happens is the composer's job is then to do something as close as possible to that temp without yeah. getting the Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. That's, that's, that's very kind of what true. That's, that's what I was asking before. They've they've got they've got a temp track in their head. Yeah. You know, they in, in their mind, licensed music is in their head. Ah, that's what you were saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, they've got, they've got license. They, they're paying license fees for yeah. music in, in their heads. They're, they're, they're into a whole other budget. They're not into a scoring budget. They're, 
they're yeah they're they're cutting to a whatever track is in their head i mean a musical track that yeah. that they love yeah and it's it's fun well, to cut to music <laughs> it's fun to cut big, to rock and roll songs it is no but the, and the biggest problem is like it's it's taking the creativity out of the composer's lap yeah yeah, 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 yeah. the job is just an emulating yeah. arranging kind of a job and it's so you know a composer's job in my opinion is to come in with something some creative idea that's different and 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 unusual or not necessarily unusual but but just different and and like but but elevates the film uh, you're investing in another piece of of the whole of of, of its of its emotional uh, power integrity yeah, yeah, in for, for, yeah, for yeah. me for me it's always been that it's always been the value of the music is always about the emotional integrity of what it is we're trying to say in our movie yeah and if you're not going for that then you're missing a big element and you're cheating in my opinion you're cheating the audience yeah. and i think you're right i think that's what's happened more and more in the last five or ten years and, and so it's just gotten diluted down and, and there's no you there's, there's there's not there's not enough new ideas coming in and 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 creativity into the scoring world it's just becoming wallpapery and and just yeah. you know not well because the conversation i think has changed you know the conversation from my perspective is about mo emotion how how do i enhance the emotion of what i'm telling my story by the use of music and here I've got this composer, and that's the conversation I want to have with him yeah. or her. Yeah. That's not happening as much today. It's more about, well, the rhythm is sort of this, and it's sort of, uh, I want I want it to feel like a, 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 a Bruce Springsteen or, or or somebody else. And, and that's what I'm looking for. As opposed to talking about, put that aside yeah. and let the composer come up with what that might be based on the conversation about emotion. And about what we're trying to accomplish in this particular scene. How yeah, do I want the audience? Approach, to... yeah, why not approach it from inside rather than the outside? You're imposing music upon it rather than saying, "Well, what yeah. would the characters? How would they speak musically?" How do I want the audience to feel at the end of this scene? Right. That that's that, not happening as much as it used to. That mm. is it right there in a nutshell, Gil. Yeah. How do I want the audience to feel? You know? Yeah. And and you know, I mean, in in this day and age, a film like the good, the bad, and the ugly. You would, you know, a composer would never have the opportunity to write a piece of music like that one was. You know? No, 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 no. Because it's like it's different, it's unusual, but it's so perfect. You know. Yeah. Um, it would yeah. be it would be a track of nothing but uh, hard driving metal, yeah. <laughs> metal sounds maybe, or whatever the director was. You know, if if he was, yeah, it, it would it would have a much more contemporary sound probably. Right, whatever the flavor of the moment is. You know. uh, dare, dare I ask the question, Nick, of uh, if we're going away from that emotionality of relationship and we're going more towards the tracks of, of what might be popular, what do we think about AI? <laughs> no, I know, a, I'll, let me rephrase. I know what we think about AI. <laughs> we well, don't like it. Yeah. But where, where yeah. do we think this is going to go? I I. I actually think it could work out in favor of what I'm supporting, you know, which is which is which is just creativity on you know for, of, of of in music in general for for film, you know, television. Because, but I don't know, you know, I don't know how clever AI is going to be. I don't yeah. know how how it's you know, but it seems to me like if you are looking for a mo emotion generated by what you're looking at on, in the picture you know can ai take that emotion can it soak in that emotion and no give you no it can't it's a computer it doesn't understand emotion it un it can describe emotion it can't feel emotion but it can replicate something that somebody says oh i want it to be like this like this but yeah. not this right right it can always do like this but it can never be this and so if that's, but, case, if that's the case then, then i think it bodes really well for for you know music you know i mean certainly it can supply reams of the type of music you hear on most tv series yeah. oh it could be a frank devol factory 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That out, you know, by the hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's like Muzak. Literally, literally, it's Muzak, man. Jeez, yeah. it just pump it out like a like yep. that. But, uh, if, but if you want something, if you want something special and 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 new and different and emotional, yeah, you know, I think it may it may just fall back in the composer's lap. Hey, God, it wouldn't. That'll be the day. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've had you for so much time, Nick, and, and uh, I, I wanted to just bring it around with one last thing. Uh, you and I got to work together once after uh, I left the Tales from the Crypt fold. You were very kind, and and I, I was doing uh, The Outer Limits up in Vancouver, and I, I did an episode that was just so strange and bizarre, and I... I reached out to you and you you very kindly uh, agreed to do the score for it, the episode. What will the neighbors think that Helen Shaver directed? And I, I, it is such a lovely it's it's a it's a quirky piece. And the score is not quirky. And that's what's excellent about it. It's mm -hmm. it doesn't the, the main character played by Jane Adams is quirky out the waz and and your score is the perfect counterpoint to the to really because in essence what you did that was very clever is I've always I always felt like the score kind of took the husband's perspective and he's the villain of the piece we just don't know until the last second oh. and it it I, I always saw that it it had his industriousness right I remember it being a really fun score and like this a really hard. fun I'm episode to, 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 to work on. I am not a well by choice, Mona. You are not a well person by choice. This my head is splitting. There's a humming in my ears. It's driving me crazy. What? Oh my god. What? Oh god, somebody just fell off the roof. What are you talking about? That help me. Help me, please. Oh. There's nothing there. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I, I, they, I, I have the sound in my head of some of the cues, you know. And yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. When I got, I was not a sci-fi guy, and when I got hired to do uh, Outer Limits, they wanted me to do you know some outside the box stuff, and and that was probably as outside the box as that whole show ever got. I it was sci-fi maybe it was sort of sci-fi but yeah. no no you was... thank you so much for for doing that score for me that's oh. no, I, i've waited all this time to say that to you no no no, no. It's, it's always a pleasure it's always been a pleasure working with you guys you know uh, likewise the feelings are mutual thank you so much for sitting with us today and uh, uh let's let's consider this part one okay yeah, yeah no. thanks nick this was fantastic Wait, really you, appreciate man. it and uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you again next time. The How Not to Make a Movie podcast is executive produced by me, Alan Katz, by Gil Adler, and by Jason Stein. Our artwork was done by the amazing Jody Webster, and Jason Jody, along with Mando, are all the hosts of the fun and informative Dads from the Crypt podcast, followed up for what my old pal the Crypt Keeper would have called terrific Crypt content.